Since even before the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, humanity's need for power has blighted the air and the water. Every year, the world uses 17.4 terawatts of energy, 31.5% of which come from coal, and 28.8% of which comes from oil. Even though we have been propelled to new technological heights by utilizing these resources, we are now faced with rampant air and water pollution, rising temperatures and sea levels, and the realization that, if we don't change our actions, we may make our Earth unlivable, and that these resources will one day be exhausted. And as soon as we recognized the problem, top scientists began to work on solutions. Today, we utilize many forms of renewable energy, such as hydroelectric, wind, geothermal, nuclear, and solar, each of which present their own unique challenges and limitations. Unfortunately, no combination of these is yet able to fully meet our energy needs without causing a drastic rise in the cost of electricity. However, some believe that our best hope lies in solar energy. As we mentioned earlier, 17.4 terawatts of energy are consumed every year. However, 120,000 terawatts worth of light energy from the sun strikes the Earth's surface every year. This means that if we could learn to harness just one seven thousandth of this energy, we could power the entire world. The way we harness solar energy from the sun is through solar panels. The current solar panels that make up a large part of the market today convert energy through PN junctions. PN solar panels convert the sun's energy into electricity through two semiconductor layers of opposite polarity. Light photons are absorbed by the panel, which excites electrons in the semiconductor. If the electron voltage of the photon is greater than the electron voltage of the band gap, this creates an electric charge within the two plates. The resulting electricity does useful work and could significantly reduce the amount of electricity needed from burning fossil fuels. Even though PN junction solar cells are able to harness energy from the sun, they do not do so very efficiently. Most PN solar cells are only able to collect about 11 to 16 percent of light energy from photons absorbed by the solar cell. This problem occurs because semiconductors can only effectively absorb only small fractions of light wavelengths from above. As shown in the picture, semiconductors each have a certain band gap the excited electrons must cross. If the energy from the light photon is not equal to or greater than the band gap, light will not be absorbed. A different kind of solar cell uses a material called perovskite. Perovskite, in reference to solar cells, generally applies to materials with a similar structure as perovskite in nature. Perovskite cells are better than PN cells because they are simpler to make and they make more efficient use of the energy from the sun's light photons. Perovskite solar cells are close to 20% efficient, whereas PN cells are 11 to 16% efficient. Perovskite solar cells have an optimal band gap between 2.3 electron volts and 1.6 electron volts, whereas PN solar cells have an optimal band gap of 1.1 to 1.2 electron volts. Therefore, it should be capable of higher efficiencies than PN cells. A sample of perovskite solar cells is shown in the picture. Perovskite is such an amazing breakthrough in science because in the last five years it has increased in efficiency from 3% to around 20%. As shown by the graph, silicon solar cells have had a steady increase in efficiency over the years, whereas the efficiency of perovskite solar cells has increased exponentially since they were first used in solar energy. Perovskite is more promising because it is cheaper to make the thin films that coat glass substrates, which conducts a similar role as semiconductors. Probably the most important perovskite structure in research is methylammonium lead iodide because it has an ideal band cap of 1.8 electron volts for absorbing photons with varying wavelengths. With this band gap, perovskite can absorb ultraviolet and visible light. Some research done with perovskite absorption shows that it can sometimes even absorb infrared light. Scientists refer to methylammonium lead iodide as perovskite because it has the same crystal and atomic structure as mineral perovskite or calcium titanate. Perovskite structure is commonly known as ABX3, which is versatile in the sense that the crystal structure's unit cell can vary from cubic to tetrahedral to orthorhombic at STP. In a cubic unit cell, lead is located in the center of the lattice, coordinated with three iodine ions and methylammonium ions at the corners.
The flexibility of bond angles inherent of perovskite structures responsible for the many different types of distortions which can occur from the ideal structure. These variations are what allow methylammonium, lead, iodide, and other surrogates to be considered perovskite. In solution processing, lead halide and methylammonium iodide can be dissolved into a solution using a strong solvent like dimethylformamide, aka DMF. Before spin coating, the glass substrate and solution are preheated. When spin coated, they quench and form larger grain sizes. Spin coating is a procedure using a spin coater to create thin films on flat substrates. The perovskite film on the glass substrate is then post annealed at 100 degrees Celsius to remove internal stresses and encourage larger grain sizes of the material. Here you will see a demonstration of the thin film creation process. After pre annealing the substrate, we then move it over to the spin coater. The spin coater is then set to 4000 RPM for 15 seconds. We then take the methylammonium lead iodide and place it on the substrate and then starts the spinning process. As you can see, the thin film creates a brown layer over the substrate. All right, time's up. We then take the cooled substrate and walk it over to another heater for the post annealing process. The substrate is then placed on the heater for 20 minutes at 100 degrees Celsius to encourage larger grain sizes. Perovskite structure has a high tolerance for halogen ion vacancies, making it an ideal electrode or cathode material for solar cells. The vacancies can significantly change the conductivity of the material and make it a very effective electrode. Some perovskite materials have an operating temperature of 90 Kelvin, which is significantly higher than other superconducting materials, meaning it can harness greater amounts of energy. In fact, perovskite is the only crystal structure that is ferroelectric, meaning that it can exhibit a permanent magnetic moment which is not because of an external magnetic field, but because of its crystal structure. Among perovskite structural properties include durability and chemical flexibility. Perovskite may be easier to make than PN junction solar cells and more efficient, but it still has its own limitations. Perovskite solar cells so far do not last very long. They chemically break down in just a few hours, and they also aren't much more efficient than today's PN junction solar cells. The last major setback is they are not nearly as accessible to consumers today as PN junction solar cells are. While perovskite solar cells may have a lot of potential and may be the key to solar success in the future, PN junction cells currently have a higher commercial efficiency because of many experiments conducted in the last decade. Researchers believe further advances in solar cell technology should take care of the problem. But right now, the material's challenge with solar cells is to build a cell that is much more efficient than today's cells, is commercially marketable, cheap, and easy to produce. As of now, those are the major setbacks from single-handedly saving a withering world.